And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a, re I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming Hello. straight from the Penthe Games, hopefully I, I pronounced that right. Yes. And the creator of Nev of Nevermore, which is going to be all about gothic, hor gothic horror, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one, the one and only Ian, <laughs> Ian Lemke. Jeez, what? Why did I think? Why did I mispronounce it and then have to correct myself at the last second? <laughs> That's all right. Good thing it's recorded. Yeah. So, so how how are you doing tonight? I know, I know that it's. Well, it's starting to get cold up here. I'm not sure if it's starting to get cold down there. We're actually having uh, record-breaking cold, cold down here. So it is a, it's supposed to be below freezing here uh, in Atlanta, which is unusual for this time of year. But thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Wow. First introduction to role-playing games was when I was, I think, seven years old. Uh, <clears throat> my, I went, uh, my parents were divorced. Uh, I went over to my dad's one weekend, and he was like, I got this cool new game to play, uh, which was the, the original uh, Blue Blue Book Holmes edition. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, made, he, uh, we, we went through it and made, made a character and, and uh, went through the little dungeon that was in the back of the book. Um, I made two characters that were completely unoriginal. I think I used names straight from the book. One, one was Bruno the Battler, and the other was Miller the Dragon Killer. Um, <laughs> Miller Miller did not make it through the dungeon. I, I'm sorry to say, uh, but uh, yeah, that was my first experience. My my dad, as he says to this day, never really quite got it. He just did, didn't um, because you know a game without an end was a new concept at that time. But being you know seven years old, that I was like, this is cool. This is awesome. It's just like a, an ongoing story. Um, what made it stick? I that's hard to say. Uh, I, I was just in love with the whole idea of of an ongoing story that you can do, and and and, and being and making a, you know characters that are the center of the story. Uh, you know, and being able to tell your own and you know create your own stories essentially. Though I quickly kind of transitioned to becoming uh, a dungeon master, <laughs> um, and and more or less stuck with that. I mean, I've played a lot in my life, but I've probably game mastered at least more than twice what I've played. But confession is good for the soul when it comes to being a forever DM. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, I'm not. I, I do play, but I'm not one of those DMs who never, never plays. But uh, uh, because I find it, I find it good to play from time to time, especially as a game designer. Um, you kind of want to see things from the other side as well, especially with a new game. Mm -hmm. Well, i i make the, I make the I make the joke, but I've always one gag that I've always wanted to do if I can get if I can get the right editing set up for it is. A, is a parody of those of of those sad of those sad infomercials just w just with a forever DM support group <laughs> would be funny yes or t or um or see if I can get see if I can get a bunch of people to do a sketch together to to do a um parody of an AA meeting about about people who are recovering for, from being forever DMs yeah I'd hate to touch on that area though it's a little I don't know <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be could be funny. I think I I've al I've always had a unique sense of humor. I'll put it I'll put it that way. <laughs> plus, we need that in the world. Plus, I think I think every D I think every DM has. A little bit of the desire to mess with their players in some way. Yeah, 
I I've evolved a lot in the way that I game that I DM. I've never been an antagonistic uh, game master, and certainly when I've run LARPs, I mean, you know, making your players cry is sort of the <laughs> the end goal, right? To put them through as much angst as possible. Um, uh, and and sometimes I feel that way in, in tabletop games, and you know, you, you want something that's uh, that really takes people through the emotional ringer. Um, other times, I don't know. I, I I do. I admit I'm I'm a game master who likes to see the players win. Um, but um, yeah, each have their own styles, yeah. and they're all that equally valid. I'm not antagonistic. I I just I just like to I just like to put yep. things to uh, mess with people's heads, or or in some cases, um, play play with their own paranoia. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. When, there, yeah. when there's the, when there's that kind of person who feels that they always have to check for traps, um, right? I will intentionally put in fake put in fake traps so that so that so that ev and in the process in the process giving them the hint of saying you don't need to check for traps every other square, idiot. Right. <laughs> if if and if I don't say it, usually the players w the players will and. Everybody knows not to cheat at my table because there are certain, because of the punishment game. Interestingly, that's a that's a game design thing too. Uh, in that <laughs> you'd be bringing that up, it, and it's something that as a game designer, I'm always looking to avoid is um, a situation where a player constantly has to ask to do something uh, because I, I just feel it. Really, you know, I mean, it's fair though, right? Because it, the, the the instant they don't check for a trap, that's when the trap hits. Um, so it's sort of hard to convince someone not to do that, uh, but it ends up taking so much time in the game. So like, you know, having systems where at least the initial aspect of it's automatic, um, but then, uh, you know, if they want you know more detail or to remove the trap, you have to make the test, you know, that kind of thing. Um, is sort of how I try to go at things. In fact, I have I have some systems in Nevermore that, that work exactly like that. Mm -hmm. And I I do I do recall I do recall one of one of the more infamous fake traps was when somebody was when somebody was cautious about a about a treasure chest that they found at the end of a dungeon being a mimic. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't a mimic. But when they opened the when they opened the chest, inside it was another chest. <laughs> and you've seen those Russian nesting dolls, right? Right. Yep. Then you've got an idea of what I was doing. Chest inside a chest inside a chest. Yes. Cool. Um. Uh, or in so, in in some case in some cases I've um I've done I've. I've given people rem I've given people reminders that they should that they should not trust the laws of physics to always work consistently. Hmm. Uh, Which, as long as they have a warning about that, I think you know that's perfectly reasonable. I usually I usually give people a a primer that's either one page or or two pages about what kind of game it is, and in in this case, I had I had made it clear that this was going to be a weird kind of game. Mm-hmm. Um. The kind of th the kind of thing that wouldn't that wouldn't be too far removed in one of Lewis Carroll's work, right? From an Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass kind of yep. situation. So, so when the do when the door was up when the door was up on the was up on the ceiling, and I, and I had already I had already given a note I had already given a note saying saying ev saying everything is a floor if you if you have the right perspective, and. Three of the people couldn't figure out the puzzle. One of them just one of them just realized just walk on the wall. And as it turns out, you could walk on the wall in this in this in this house with absolutely no problem. Oh, cool! Yeah, and that kind of thing would be, be a lot of fun. You know, playing playing with expectations. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not doing that, I'm giving somebody a very powerful item, but also very dangerous. Um. There was the infamous thunder crossbow, which is uh, would do a lot of sonic damage whenever it was fired. But if you if you remember the noisy cricket from Men in Black, that you know the other side of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, you and trying to trying to lean against a wall and and fire it isn't going to work because 
Well, the well the wall's not there anymore. Yeah, well, that's fair. But now with with Nevermore mm -hmm. getting back on the rails, the it's built it's it it is built around gothic horror and yes it is kind of funny that this is the second gothic horror type game i've covered on this channel in the last few months <laughs> what was the, i'm just curious what was the other one uh the other one was was the expansion expansion to backwater oh okay yeah i saw something about that which is more southern gothic horror but still counts yeah um, absolutely what since since a lot, since a lot of people, I think a lot of people are familiar with gothic horror, but not necessarily the name. Um, how do you define gothic horror to people who aren't as familiar with the concept? Um, it's more rather than just you know monster hunting, uh, you know, like you know, like supernatural, or you know, like there are some other role playing games I'm not gonna mention. Uh, it's it's more about uh, the the sense of dread um and and creating an environment um that that really resonates with uh you know the the, the gothic the american gothic greats um and you know these places that are forlorn where uh you know all the people maybe behave and it. it's sort of like you were talking about like you know physics but not working right it, particularly in nevermore there are particular areas called etheros uh that uh the things just uh are different and and things might fun you know, physics might function differently as you said um but instead of physics it might be that you know uh, horrific things happen but people just sort of accept it as a day-to-day -day, uh you know experience uh that you know they don't they don't react to it like one would expect um emphasize you know mystery uh and 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 solving you know and investigating a problem rather than facing it head on uh and you know and just attacking it uh it, with the nevermore adventures and stories there right, the the idea is to resolve these places where that where these atheros ap appear um and to and you but you don't necessarily have to fight the monsters that are there you, you might want to try and avoid them in fact um but uh it, it that's usually through finding out some some ancient wrong something something someone had done to someone or you know maybe a murder had been committed or someone hadn't uh, someone hadn't been laid to rest properly or there's a cursed relic or you know any number of things like th this that that you might be able to do find and and discover a way of of ending the atheros but you know setting the wrong right uh you know burying the person who wasn't buried properly destroying the the evil relic you know wh whatever that might be um but you might have to face monsters along the way as well mm -hmm. <laughs> and i realize i realize that for a lot of people the the ease the easy entries to gothic horror would be the works of Poe or or Shelley or the like, but mm -hmm. within the book, do you have do you have plans on putting a appendix N for um, recommended reading or v or viewing for somebody who wants to get a feel for oh, Gothic Horror? Absolutely, I, I, I will have like a big list of you know books and and in particular stories even uh, by different authors and such that that are they're good um and then movies as well um you know one of the best out there right now as far as mo well really more tv series than movies is probably the, the mike flanagan and the stuff he's been doing like haunting on uh, haunting of hill house and bly manor and uh what is it uh, midnight um i can't remember the name of the other one but uh and he's actually doing uh house of usher uh which is going to be, from what I understand, is going to be the fall of the House of Usher, but then mashing in a bunch of other Poe stories into it as well. Um, so yeah, there's, yeah, I would definitely have that. And I I, I do a blog for the, uh, you know, for, for Nepenthe and, and just for my general gaming blog as well. And I, I've actually been, uh, been posting up like, you know, particular stories, uh, American Gothic horror stories and how they could be used in Nevermore and how they could become, you know, Nevermore adventures. Mm -hmm. 
And I th I think that's vital to do when you have a when you have a genre that isn't going to be at that isn't going to have an immediate one to one. Right. I mean, obviously, I agree. there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of things to draw to draw upon, but I look at gothic horror the same way I look at wuxia fiction. It's a it's a genre that everybody's seen, but they don't know. Right, right, and yeah, that's <laughs> that is in fact, and also like the um, the next stretch goal we have coming up, which is going to be a, a narrator's kit. Which is going to be all about that. With the, with, it's not really going to be new rules or anything like that, but it's going to be a lot of material. It's going to be a 24 page PDF booklet that just tells you how to run a Nevermore game. Um, because I think that's something that's missing from a lot of role playing games, even. They sort of assume you know how to play the setting. Uh, it might be something really esoteric, even. Um, but uh so yeah i'm going to give people you know a lot of story hooks a lot of you know here here's adventure ideas here's uh, you know here are american gothic stories and and how they would translate into an adventure and, and that kind of thing yeah now one of the other things that really drew my attention when i was when i was going through the quick start and the like is the fact that you're using a card-based design when it comes to both character creation and, and advancement as well as just just being the all roads lead to Rome of the game. Yep. Um, what made you want to go with cards instead of the more traditional method of different types of dice? So, as you know, all game designers borrow from somewhere. And <laughs> yeah. I think they but, apply to art just as a whole. Yeah, that, that is art as a whole. Um, but, I, I mean, when, when I thought about Gothic, it, you know, it, Gothic literature, or Gothic horror. I, I mean, I immediately thought you know, dice. I mean, I'm sorry, cards. It, it, it just feels more appropriate. And of course, Castle Falkenstein back in the day. Uh, I loved that game. It used cards. wasn't entirely fond of the system. I didn't think it quite worked, but I loved the idea of it. Um, and and it just felt it felt appropriate for this. It felt more mystical. It almost feels like you're casting a spell or whatever whenever you're you know laying out your cards. Or you get the sense of like it, the nice thing about cards, like dice, you sort of have to have a table to play at, right? But it cards you can do like sitting around your living room a lot easier. Uh, and, and so you could have that sense of sitting around the parlor, you know, by the fire and play Nevermore with, <laughs> and everybody has their deck of cards. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, I was originally thinking of doing something that was going to be a hybrid cards and dice, uh, and the more I, I tinkered with it, I went back and forth, and uh, I just decided that just cards was the way to go. Um, it's probably for the best that you did, because if, yeah. if um, you had done cards and dice, people probably would have um, compared you to Savage Worlds. That was part of the reason I didn't do cards and dice as well. <laughs> didn't want to be that close to that. And I will say that the system in this functions very differently than Castle Falkenstein. It just happens to use cards as well. Um, well I've always I've always felt the temptation of being annoying and saying, "Is it Falkenstein or Falkenstein?" I have no idea. <laughs> I don't Ask think Mike, I... Pond, Mike, Mike Pondsmith can tell you. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I I have I have no I have no idea, and I'm and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure Pondsmith might flip might flip between the two anyways. So, I believe it's Steen, but uh, but you know, I, uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's like the whole thing of the Berenstein. Is it the Berenstein or the Berenstein Bears? Right, exactly. Uh oh. Plus, I like plus. Um, I use that gag because I liked Young Frankenstein. Yeah, that's the, that that gag gets used quite well there. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what came to mind. But just out of curiosity, were at any point did you ever did you ever learn of the two T TSR games under the Saga system? No, Wh like which? What do you mean, like Boot Hill or were those? No, no Boot Hill which... was deep, Boot Hill was still percentile die. I'm referring yeah, was, to okay. Dragonlance Fifth Age and the Marvel Adventure game. Ah, um, no, I'm not that familiar with those. Because yeah, that was that was my first introduction to the idea of using um, cards as a core mechanic. 
Did Mar Marvel? I mean, I remember the one Marvel superheroes game, but that used percentiles as well. Um, I call it kind. That one. The full title is Marvel Superheroes Adventure Game. You're thinking of uh, Marvel Phase Rip, which was percentile, kind of, and I, I really don't want to get into the no. action control <laughs> table right now. Right. But uh, no, I, I, I was, I'm not that familiar with with those. I, I, I never actually played them. Played a lot of role playing games, not those two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Ar some, some could argue I've played too many. Ah, never. That's like that's like saying that's like saying that you've that you have enough dice. Right. Exactly. And that's the other thing. Pe the, I, the people get. Uh, you know, some people are really married, married to their dice. They they want dice. That's great. And you know, there's a ton of games out there you can use your dice for. But it, it, you don't have to just have a normal deck of playing cards. There's a ton of really cool decks out there. Um, plus, I mean, you could even use you know a tarot deck if you wanted. You know, something really creepy. You just have to take some cards out, but you could certainly I've, do it. I've had I've had I've had Tweed on to talk about Everway. So there's okay. that, so there's that deck as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But I did want it to use a standard deck of playing cards. I didn't I didn't want to have to, you know, like people to have to buy a particular deck to play it. Because I've seen some card you know, games that use cards, but you have to buy their deck, you know. And then it, what happens if you don't have that deck or you lose a card? Then you have to get another one. I, I want people to, you know, they're, they're somewhere, they have their book, uh, they want to play, they can go down to the drugstore, buy a couple packs of cards, and, and you're good to go. Now, given the nature of of um, attribute and skill that that the game has, one thing I'm curious about is what is um is in regard to how advancement works. Is it going to be a case of getting XP from play and then sp and then spending it? Kind of. Uh, it's going to be a little more. Yes, you're going to basically have points, and then certain point values will yeah will will, will allow you to uh, advance skills. Um, I'm going to actually have the first reveal of that on uh, the uh, the uh, the actual play that I'm doing tomorrow night um, because we did we did a series of three games uh, a month ago, and we're going to we're going to start off with a, a new series of three games. Um, and um, three sessions, rather. Uh, they're going to be playing the same character, so we're actually going to go through character advancement at the beginning of that. It's going to be the first time anybody's you know, seen that out there. <laughs> so, But yes, it, it's basically you get X number of points per adventure based on you know whatever the, the length of the adventure, things like that, the, you know, different factors, how many points you get. And then uh, raising different things will cost have different costs like you know for example you know for example raising a new a skill would be something like you know if you're raising it from two to three it'll cost you three points um that kind of thing mm -hmm. now with and, that yeah. with no, with that in with that in mind mm -hmm. so as i as i understand it the the core the core four attributes that's what you have to shoot under and the skill is how you generate your is the primary way that you're going to be generating your hand. Yes, yes. The num the level of your skill, which is skills are rated one to five, and the number the level of your skill is how many cards you get to draw. Then there are modifiers. There can be modifiers to that depending on circumstances or your condition, or and then you can also spend grit uh, to to raise uh, the number to increase the number of cards you draw as well. Um, and then you're you're trying to get. Each of the four core stats, uh, Cardia, Corpus, Psyche, and Numa, um, depending on which one you're using with, with the skill, uh, you're trying to get equal to or under the, the number of that skill, which is anywhere from two to ace. The, the stats actually you know, range two to ace, usually somewhere in the five to five to eight, eight nine range. Um, at least it's starting. It, or of the same suit, because each stat has a suit that goes with it. Cardia, which is social, is hearts. Corpus, which is physical stuff, is clubs. Psyche, which is intellectual, you know, knowledge, is spades. And Numa, which is which is practical knowledge and willpower, is it's kind of the weird one, uh, is diamonds. Um, so if you're trying to punch someone and you're using fisticuffs, you know, you'd be using your corpus. So if you 
uh, say you have a seven corpus, if, if, you're, if your card is a seven or under, it's a success. If it's a club, it's a success. Um, so you always have a 25%, you know, more than 25% chance of success with each card. If it's both, you get a bonus. You get something called fortune, uh, uh, which you can spend right away for an additional success, or you can keep it to do other stuff with. Mm-hmm. Now, each, now from, now as I understand it, the pl- the player ca- the player characters are assumed to be members of a particular organization, the Esoteric yes. Order of the Illuminists, which yes. is divided into several cabals. Yes. Um, now, would these cabal- would these cabals be be akin to be akin to an archetype? I.e., they'll give you a few things, but everything else is fi- is free form. Fairly free form. What, what the what the archetype ba- no, sorry what the cabal basically does is give you what kind of special powers you have. Um, what your your method of of approaching you know dealing with with the etheros and and with uh, you know with the uh, you know etheric entities out there as it were or your antagonists. Um, and and it, yeah, so that that gives you those special abilities. Your skills are. I mean, it's, it's going to be a little. You get some that are locked in there, but but uh, assigning skills is fairly open. Um, there, there are certain points at which things are locked in, but uh, yeah, and, and it's just sort of your your mindset and your your point of view. Um, you have soldiers and Mithras, which are you know the, they're they're your paladins, right? You know they well, they have powers of light and shield and use and shielding and you know can defend and attack, blow up spirits pretty much on their own. I I'd like because I'd like to go through top to bottom and just and just what each one brings to the table. Sure. Yeah. And so, of course, going from the top to bottom on the quick start, we start with the etheric engineers. Yes. Etheric engineers are your steampunk engineers, except for the they use the aether, not steam, uh, to power their devices. Uh, and aether is aether is what makes the world of never more different uh it's what allows magic to exist it's what al- it, and also allows monsters to exist most places in the world there's little or no aether even even in the world of never never more um however in these particular places it pools and coalesces and becomes something known as etheros and they tend to get stronger and stronger um so but but etheric engineers you it use the aether to you know create Cool gadgets, um, you know, of all kinds of different things. You know, some useful, some just fun. Um, mm-hmm. so, and I, okay. I'd like to say something about that. The this, I try to with Nevermore not have a lot of record keeping and stuff. Mm-hmm. So rather than saying in advance, okay, I'm building this device and this device and this device. The way it works is it, if you come to a point in the story that you want to use a device, you spend a point of fortune, which you can always spend fortune even if you don't have it. That's a, another story. But um, it, so you're never limited in that. And, and then you just make a test to see if the device works. You're just assumed to have already you know, made it or had it you know, at, in, in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, would it be fair to say that etheric engineers fit the weird scientist kind of, kind of archetype? Absolutely. Yep, weird scientists, but yeah, but but more physical sciences than than you know astronomy or something. But yes, yes, they're definitely the weird scientists. Um, you know, they're your your even wackier Teslas and 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 those kind of you know those kind of people. The guys who the guys who have a sign outside the building saying "Days without a workplace accident" and it's constantly zero. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Ah. Uh. So that brings us to the Disciples of the Emerald Tablet. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're your alchemists. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, they, you know, basically they make potions and, and unguents and, and that sort of thing. Uh, they work much the same way as etheric engineers. They have certain, uh, they have certain recipes, uh, formulas that, that they can, of things that they can make, uh, which expand with experience or find, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, it, it, when you go to use one, you're just assumed to have made it previously and and have it. And you just spend a fortune and and make your test to see if it works, basically. So you know you don't have to have all that written on your sheet. So th- 
And they also have a sign outside saying "Days Without a Workplace." Yes, <laughs> yes. These are, these are your two your two crafters. You know the the people that make stuff uh, and and that you know that can be useful and yeah and blow stuff up a lot too. Well, as long as they as long, I would make a joke about the out about the about the keeping your fingers rule with alkali metals, but I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure they ignore that. Probably, yeah. I uh. imagine so. For those for those who for those who haven't studied chemistry, the keeping your fingers rule is basically to treat any alkali metal as if it's a high explosive. Right. Uh, even if even if even if you might think that it's that is perfectly harmless, thinking that something is perfectly harmless is one way to get a Darwin Award. I um I had a friend who was a chemist, and he uh, he accidentally dropped some acid into his lap without realizing it once. Um, and uh, and I guess it, you don't feel it right away necessarily, and dug like a inch or so hole into his thigh, just a couple inches to the right. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Another inch or so to the left, and uh... <laughs> you'd probably feel it then. <laughs> yeah, probably. But next is the ravens. Yes. Um, I'm going to sort of lump uh, ravens and rooks. Rooks and ravens are sort of, uh, the, they're the next two, actually, and they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, both of them deal with social aspects and helping the, you know, members of the order uh, get through problems if you have problems with the police or, you know, or if you're, you, know, you need to get access to a building or something like that. The ravens deal with the, with, with the upper crust. Um, you know, they are the movers and shakers in the Gilded Age uh, and, and move in those circles and, and can usually, you know, open doors, you know, pretty much, you know, get, get invited to parties, whatever, whatever is necessary. Rooks deal with the seed or seedy underbelly and have well, it, I should say, ravens also have powers of persuasion and such that allow them and and sort of uh, almost psychic abilities. Um, rooks uh, deal with the underbelly that they you know tend to be your 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 rogue types, um, and they also have powers of shadow that allow them to just disappear or you know get through get through any kind of obstacle such as you know doors or locks or whatever without any trouble when i hear when i hear about rooks for for whatever reason the first thing that comes to mind is garrett garrett um specifically from the thief games ah yes yes i i, I actually never played that one <laughs> so i'm not familiar with that character um, but it sounds like it would be appropriate well he is from what I know. He first off, it's it's from the Thief Games, were the brainchild of Looking Glass. Mm -hmm. I'm which, familiar with it. I just never actually played it. But he is he is definitely he is definitely a pure thief, not a thief who might who might happen to be a master swordsman. He's honestly better at a bow with trick arrows than he is with a sword. Right. And. For him, it's all it's all about get it's all about getting in, stealing your stuff, and getting and getting out. Hopefully, with nobody noticing. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Even if it even if it involves knocking them out with a blackjack. Yep. I mean, I I try to leave the skill selection in Nevermore open enough. Like I said, there are certain er things you're like a rook is going to have to have, you know, knavery, stealth, a few things like that. That that's sort of an automatic, but what direction you take that then beyond that is sort of up to you um you know it could be a it could be a scholarly rook who you know likes to spend a lot of time in libraries it, it could be a combat you know character or it could be a straight up no one sees me i you know <laughs> no one throw sees all my me points. i am ten there are 10 ninjas in this picture right and, you know i i have all my points in knavery and stealth and, <laughs> and athletics yeah. and so yeah. next would be the scholars of Mu. Yes, scholars of Mu. Uh, there, they are your researchers, your scholars, as it were, um, and they are very skilled at at uncovering information of all kinds. Uh, that can be uh, knowing whether someone is telling the truth or whether a document is true or you know or forged. It can also be finding things in in the library or what have you. They have a they have a power that if they know what they're looking for, so, you know, a particular book or or whatever document, 
if they if they believe it's there, they can activate this power, and they can it, it just they can just go right to it. They can just walk in and oh, here it is, rather than spending hours and hours, you know, looking for things. Mm -hmm. And you already mentioned it, but I want to double dip into the soldiers of Mithras. Yes, they're they're your warriors. They're they're your paladins. Uh, you know they. They can just blast away at at etheric entities. Um, they, you know, they also have shielding powers to protect people and that sort of thing. Um, that's that's what they do. <laughs> they tend to be your gun bunnies. You know, go in and, and kill it. Yep. Um. But but I I get the feeling that even with that, you you're not designing them to be the um to be the combatant heavy. I e I e they're on I e they're only good at fighting and and little else. That's one. Correct. That's an easy trap yes. that can happen. They're they're the ones who are good, who who the way you describe it, they're good at at knowing how to deal with ho with horrors better than anyone else. Yes, I mean yes, but, but both your your so your scholars and your soldiers are, are going to be the people who are going to yeah the, the soldiers are, are probably going to know the most about like what you know identifying what something is and what it can do and and that sort of thing. Um, yes, so they aren't just mindless you know brutes, definitely not, and they often are, are investigators or that you know they could be you know police or or an exorcist. Sort of thing. Yes, that could be too. But, Absolutely, and of course, of course, last is the theurgists. Yeah, they're they're sort of the most suspicious of the group <laughs> of them all because they deal directly with etheric entities. Well, they can summon them, banish them, speak speak to the dead, that sort of thing. Um, which you know makes some of the other cabals a little, some of them a little nervous at times, but. You know, but they're also extremely useful. Uh, they can also, you know, create circles of protection that, you know, keep an etheric entity from entering. Um, that sort of thing. So, yep, that's that's pretty much them. They're your mages of the dark arts. Mm -hmm. And that would be it for now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's is now is it a case where it would, it would grant a particular get gift? Early, early on, and that's it. Or would, or are there, mul are there multiple benefits that it would grant as you advance? Oh, there are definitely uh, uh, diff new things. In fact, you'll, you'll have uh, while the pregens only have certain powers listed, even in character creation, you actually have a choice of different things, and, and there there are additional powers that then that are what, what are listed there. Um, and then as you advance, you could either spread out and get get new ones, or you or some you know they'll also advance. A lot of them will advance in in power as well. So, is it a is it a case where those things would be granted at at certain um at certain total XP thresholds, or is it a different approach? Right. It would it will definitely be through XP. I mean, you know, of course, the encouragement is to is to uh, incorporate that into the story as well, and I'll have suggestions on how to do that. Um, but if if you want to just do it as a straight XP buy, you can do it that way too. Uh, well, the reason I said threshold like that is I was thinking of of say the insight rank setup that Legend of the Five Rings had with its school system. Right. So I I didn't know if you had a plan similar to that or something else. Uh, it not 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 quite like that. No, I mean it, it'll be a little looser than that, really. And that you know, pretty much, it's this. You know, it, pretty much, you can decide what what way you want to go, whether you want to tear up or spread out. I guess. Now, with most of the attributes and skills, I can kind of see where things are meant to go, as well as the the use of courage, grit, and hardening. Mm -hmm. Um. But I'd like to ask about the sight. The sight is what allows our protagonists to see the Atheros and the see Aether uh, to determine what's out there. Um, and there are three types of sight. Uh, but, well, the sight has a stat, a score. Just it's sort of a fifth quality. Um, 
and your your site is actually your quality of your site is actually based on your weakness. You know, there's things that sort of link together. Um, but then there are three skills under the site, which are locus, materia, and spiritus. And each of the different cabals are a little better at at different ones. Uh, they can all do all of them, but uh, you know, the, the one might be better at, at a certain uh, uh, skill than the other. Um, locus is is place, um, an area. And allows you to allows the character to look at the ether and th that, well first off determine if they're in an etheros and then uh, they can make a test to try to learn about it to try to you know d discover how powerful it is what its manifestations are as I talked about earlier these places all have different effects on uh, on the on the area and they may have more than one. Uh, they might be things like I said before, like you know, the, the uh, people don't react to horrific uh, things that happen. You know, that someone gets brutally murdered, and everybody's like, "Yep, okay, he's dead," and <laughs> go about their business. Um, or it, it might be entropy, where things start to fall apart uh, and mechanical uh, things uh, start to break <laughs> and and don't work well. Um, there, there's a lot of different possibilities. They can go on and on with that. Um, that there's one where, where magic actually works better, but it can go out of control. Um, so knowing what you're dealing with is is helpful, <laughs> you know, so you, so you know what to expect a little bit. The materia is objects. It's actually you know, looking at an object. Is there aether uh, affecting this object or, or in this object? So is this object cursed or maybe possessed or or what have you? Um, or or just magical in, in some way. Um, does it have some special properties? And, and materia can be used one to, to see if it's there, and then two, what those prop you can determine what those properties are. Mm -hmm. Spiritus is people spirits. Uh, you can look at a room, see if there's a spirit present. Uh, you know, it's invis an invisible spirit present. Uh, you know, like so, this weird stuff starts happening. You could use spiritus to look and see if there's a spirit, and then uh, and and also uh, see if someone's possessed. Or maybe they're a werewolf, or you know, or what what have you. But basically, if the aether is affecting them in some way, you can tell, and then you might be able to tell a little bit about what you know how, what they are, and 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 uh, you know maybe what their weaknesses are, or you know, or what have you. And there's two ways you can use it, um, and this sort of goes with the thing we were talking about earlier. But um, uh, you can you can peek, which is basically a yes or no. So the player doesn't need to make a test. Like if, if they want to look at at, at a, uh, a, a cool old sword they found and determine if it's magical, has any magical properties, they can peek and it's a yes or no. Yes, no, okay, boom, move on. If it's no, you just move on. If it's yes, they can make a test and try to you know examine it closer and, and learn more about it. Um, and then there's in you know, and that's the second thing called peering. If you want to peer at something, you actually have to make a test. Um, and then the result of the test determines how much you learn. Yeah. And with that in mind, since you mentioned magic, I'm mm -hmm. guessing that the, I'm guessing that use of magic would be would be tied to the site. Um, use of magic is is more through ritual, and uh, I mean you don't act, you don't actually use the site in casting spells, as it were. Um, and most. Uh, well, it, members of the esoteric or the Illuminous flat out generally do not do any kind of magic uh, that is harmful or anything like that. Even even the Theragis, all of their rituals involve either controlling or protecting against, uh, you know, or summoning or whatever spirits. Um, so they don't, you know, they're and and no matter what, even the bad guys who who will use the aether for their own purposes, there's not going to be any fireballs or anything like that. Um, it, it's not that kind of game. Um, while that while there is magic, while we do have these cabals, I, I do still want it to have a you know that grounded feeling of of being a gothic horror game. Yeah, and I, and I could I could easily see that they that. Even in the that everybody agrees that there is no safe way to do these kind of things, right? There's exactly. Safer, yes, but that's that's like saying you only put a little bit of Mentos in your Diet Coke, right? And and that's that's a big debate within the order. Uh, you know, is this is a small Atheros okay? Like maybe could we use it to you know 
to perform experiments and such in, or should we destroy all of them? <laughs> you know, yeah. So the, it that's sort of like I said, that's kind of a debate within within the order itself. There are other mystical groups out there who seek out Atheros to use them for their own purposes, um, because they can perform magic there, you know, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, one of the adventures I have involves a, uh, a basically a an evil version of, of an etheric engineer um, who uses uh, their etheros to uh, do a lot of crazy Frankenstein-ish kind of things. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, what what I'm reminded of when you mentioned that is how there is how there's if you if you don't mind me bringing up bringing up Warhammer again, there's a, there is, there is always that subsect of the Inquisitors that um, push things a little bit. I'm, of course, talking about mm -hmm. the Radicals. Right. They're, okay. they're, they're technically fighting the good fight, but the methods are questionable. Right. And that's where the Ther that's, that's sort of how the rest of the Cabals view the Theragists. Because they're kind of directly interacting with these things. Um, th that makes people a little bit nervous. Though, I mean, you know, one could say Aetheric Engineers or Disciples of the Amber Tablet are dabbling with it too because they need a little bit of Aether to power their stuff. <laughs> you know, it's not going to work otherwise. Mm -hmm. Soldiers what? of Mithras. Oh, go ahead. But, e but even, w even with that... I know, I know that with um, courage, the main way that that can go down is seeing some sort of horrifying thing. But do you do you plan on having advice in say the GM section so that that so, so that the risk of courage and having to make hardening tests doesn't get overused? Yes, um, and and, and the, also like if you're encountering the same thing over and over again within a story, you, you, you stop needing to make courage tests. But they are really for courage has four. There are four different methods of hardening. Hardening it resist is your resistance to losing courage, and there are, are things other than uh, just. Uh, just seen horrors that you know etheric horrors that that do that i mean if you have a friend die uh if you if you lose something important to you um uh you know that would that would be a test as well so you you, you have loss there's basically four different, there's there's loss identity uh violence and horror and so if you you know undergo or commit you know a, a, a heinous act of violence that would require a courage test um if you, you know, uh, if you break a vow or someone, you know, betrays you, that would be an identity uh, courage test. You know, and we went over the others, of course, encountering, you know, horrible monsters. But the more you do that, the higher your hardening gets, um, which can which can have its own drawbacks. Uh, I didn't actually go over that in the quick start. It's one of the things I'm saving for the core book. But if your hardening gets too high... Uh, you that has negative effects as well, um, you know, because if you if you witness too much violence and you, don't, you know, stop caring about violence anymore, that's going to have an impact on who you are. And again, again, gothic horror is about the psychological. Mm. So. And with that with that in mind, one of the one of the things I saw on the um on the character examples that were given on the pregens was um background does background how much of a role does background play into character creation um all all of the uh, uh your your background your social status and your calling all affect ca character creation to some degree um they sort of guide uh some of the uh uh, so, you know, some of the, the the things that you get that you have access to, they, they affect how wealthy you are, and they also affect some of your skills. Um, like I said, the major the the greater portion of your skills is sort of up to people to place where they want, but each of those impacts that along the way hmm. as an impact. And one of the other th one of the other things I was curious about is. As I under as I understand it, within the core book, you are go you're um you're de you're devoting a good amount of time to 
to the, to this gothic Baltimore. Yes. Um, now within that, I'm I'm not expecting a full on adventure, but do you have plans on sprinkling um, story seeds throughout the districts that you're going to be setting up? Oh, absolutely. That that's the the, the full intent. I, I I mean, it's not going to be a huge chunk of the book, but it it is going to be in there as the core setting for the game. Um, theoretically, you could put it wherever you want. Uh, but yes, uh, each, you know, it, I'm definitely going to break it up by neighborhoods a bit and there will be different story seeds and, and there will, there's, uh, assuming we have the narrator's kit, there's going to be a sample, which I, I know I'm pretty sure we're going to hit that stretch goal. It's the next one. There'll be a short adventure in that that's set directly in Baltimore. Um, so yeah, you'll have a lot of, a lot of stuff to work with. Um, uh, I chose Baltimore for a number of reasons. And of course, I'll start with that I why well, I was born in Pennsylvania, lived there for a long time for for 10 years and then moved to Baltimore when I was 10 and so I kind of grew up in Baltimore City. Um I used to catch the bus across the street from Poe's grave coming home from work. Uh so I was kind of steeped in that, you, you know, that and it's a very gothic city in a lot of ways. Uh and at this time, it's actually one of the fastest growing cities in the country it's it's almost outpacing new york at this point with the number of immigrants coming in um it, and i did not want to set it in the northeast uh because there is a, another game uh which is set very solidly uh in uh, new england another horror game uh, which is about 40 years set about 40 years later <laughs> call cthulhu um so I, I didn't want to go with with, uh, with New England because it just because that's just so firmly ensconced in people's minds there, um, and I didn't want to go full. If you go much further south, you're into Southern Gothic, you know, which is almost a different thing, um, in in different feel and style. So Baltimore seemed the ideal location. Uh, you know, it's sort of it's it's not northern, it's not southern, it's kind of right in the middle, um, and uh, and you, and you can send your characters off in either direction easily. You know, <laughs> they can get to New York fairly easily. They can get you know they they could go down to Richmond fairly easily. Um, you, you have a lot of options, and the Appalachian Mountains are right there too. Lots of creepy stuff there. Mm -hmm. Now. With now, uh, with that in mind, with that in mind, um, when it, the idea of doing a haunt essentially, I think is something that would be tricky for both new G both new GMs and even veteran GMs to content to wrap their head around. Right. Not to not to not to slag on anybody's ability to GM, but it's more the fact that. It's easier to get people to wrap their head around a dungeon with monsters in it. It's a little hard to get people to wrap their head around a, around the idea of a haunt that is that is meant to feel wrong in some way. Right. Um, there is, I mean, the idea of the Atheros, which are haunts, as you put it, uh, it is our. Um, is is very much a part of the game and and there's going to be a lot of information on that as well as a lot of guidance on on how to you know create your own um in fact like i said each each uh etheros ha has different manifestations and you know big section on different manifestations that etheros can have and i think you know those are all great jumping off points for what's going on there and inspiration for different kind, you know, to give each haunter a Theros a different feel. And, and a Theros can be any size. It could be a room, <laughs> you know, it's just this one room that, that's haunted and has something weird going on. It can be a house. Uh, it can be a village or a mountain valley. Um, they, they vary in size and the size doesn't necessarily uh, speak to the strength of it. You know, you could have a really big but weak uh, Atheros, or you could have a really, uh, a really small but terrifyingly strong Atheros. You know, think Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing you have some you have some bit of advice for for creating haunts as well as absolutely yes um, in the core rule book and then again assuming we reach the, the narrators get stretch goal there's gonna be a ton more in there on you know step by step how to you know <laughs> here's a billion story ideas and that, that's what that book is going to be for 
Cool. Have you considered a um random haunt generator? Um d- We'll see. Uh, that That is actually a uh, thing in the back of my head, and I'm not sure if it'll go in there or not, but it's basically a, a deck draw, you know, to create your own create your own story using, you know, draws from a deck, uh, from a card deck. So I, it, it, I haven't decided for sure yet um, whether it's going to go in there. I'm just random generation tables. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I love them. And then even if you don't actually use it as a random generation table, it's just, you know, having big lists like that are sometimes really helpful. Like, oh, that's a cool idea, you know, that, and then spin off your own thing from that. Yeah, there's, um, I've used mission generators in Shadowrun for games that aren't, that aren't even um, times when I'm running Shadowrun. <laughs> or, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and of course, there's all, there's always the, Insa- there's always the insanity of of random life path generation in any Artel Saurian work. Right. Yep. And I, I mean, that's the thing. I wanted to. Uh, what I, I, the character creation is definitely not going to be random, but uh, or not have a random thing. But but yeah, I, I thought of an idea of like I have a I have a concept for doing almost like a tarot card read to create a to create an adventure, <laughs> but using playing cards. Yeah, that would. I'd say that I'd say that would um, would be a much better fit. Mm-hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for it? Um, the page count right now is uh, at two hundred eighty pages. We actually just added eight pages to that, uh, thanks to stretch goals. So we're looking at about two hundred eighty-eight pages. Uh, I, I will say that's that's a you know, I I can't guarantee it's going to come in exactly 288. Um, I you know it may be a little over, it may be a couple under. Um, it just sort of depends on how the you know how things come out uh, in the final layout. But I'm doing the word count at 625 words a page. You know, I'm going to shoot. Yeah, that that's going to be uh, my my guide for how many pages there are. So 288. I don't even know what that total is. Yeah, and obviously stretch goals might might mess with the page count as it is. Right. Yeah. So, now, with that in mind, I do I do want to offer my congratulations since your initial goal was 10k and you're at 15.3k at the time of this recording. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard date, but a general um, ballpark. I have it in the Kickstarter uh, definitely by September of next year is the is my release date. If I can do it sooner, um, I will. A lot of the limitation on that isn't even going to be me so much as printing. Um, I do. Th- there is some additional writing that needs to be done. Um, it, all, 90% of that is is setting stuff, uh, and but and also. Uh, uh, I have. I'm bringing in another writer who is uh, Nikki Ray, uh, who worked with me on Changeling back in the day, um, and she's she's from Appalachia uh, and and of uh, Native American heritage. So she's going to be writing um, some of that stuff for me, uh, which will be really cool. Uh, so I still have to get that in. Um, and Rich Dansky, one of the stretch goals was uh, Richard Dansky, who was the uh, one of the uh, developers for Wraith the Oblivion, and he's also a horror author in his own right. He's going to be writing a Nevermore short story for the beginning of the book. Um, and then, of course, we'll have to go, you know, I have to finish development, and uh, we're going to go through a, a little bit more playtesting. I, I want to do some more playtesting at higher levels, sort of, you know, more advanced characters. Um, and we're going to do that, and then editing, and then layout <laughs> then it has to go to uh, to get printed um and printing is weird uh right now so you know i'm gonna do my best uh i i put it out to september i was originally going to shoot for july but in talking to the printer there are some printer block out times there because of other stuff they got going on uh that i ended up pushing it back to september to make sure we hit our deadline mm-hmm. i'd rather be early than late <laughs> <laughs> Under promise, over deliver, right? Yeah. Plus, 
Well, so I think we've I think we've all seen we've all we've all seen those ca we've all seen those cases of is it can is that actual time or DMV time or is it actual time or restaurant time? Right, right. Which is why I I went and gave it plenty of time. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, like I said, I'd, I'd rather say, look, it's going to be almost, you know, it's going to be 11 months, you know, um, but, you know, if I can get it, you know, if it, somehow it can get it in August or July, yay, you know, that would be fantastic. I mean, I want it to get out as quickly as possible, too, because at that point it can go into, into uh, you know, in the shops and be distributed and stuff, too, so, like, I want to sit on it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I promise I will do my absolute best not to make any quote the Raven jokes. And if you do, I've probably heard them before. That's what <laughs> that's why I wouldn't do them because it's because it's too obvious. If right. I'm gonna make if I'm gonna make jokes, I'd rather be creative. Yeah, I I, I even do a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here it's a fascinating temple this is an interesting place thank you for having me and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> who knows maybe i'll come back in a different guise <laughs> oh, i'd probably see right through it probably i would hope so and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!